What you see now is not reality. Of course, you know that. You could easily point to many of the differences between this video recording and your reality. This recording is constrained to fit within a certain number of pixels, a limited number of colors. There are many other technological limitations. This recording took place some time ago, and it took place in your reality, but the recording you're looking at now is not reality. Of course, your screen exists in reality, and in that sense, you are experiencing reality right now, but the images that you see on your screen are merely a distorted, symbolic representation of reality. I can withhold information, I can deceive you, I can stay hidden out of frame. Or I can reveal myself. This is chess. Chess is a game. It has a set of rules, a set number of pieces, a specific board. If you change the rules or the number of pieces of the board, it becomes something other than the game of chess. In reality, the universe which we all share is not unlike the game of chess. As Thomas Huxley said, the board is the world. The pieces are the phenomena of the universe. The rules are what we call the laws of nature. And yes, I did recently watch The Queen's Gambit. We aren't even close to fully understanding the rules of our world, but we know that they exist. We know that there are principles which reliably govern the motion of planets and galaxies and molecules and subatomic particles and everything that makes up our reality. Since the ancient times, humans have tried to comprehend the nature of reality. Is our reality merely an illusion, a hallucination which we all share, as Buddhism teaches? Is reality a creative process in which we are all connected, as we read in the Tao? Are there essential forms of all things which physical forms can never quite encapsulate, as Plato speculated? These are all questions of ontology, the study of the nature of reality. During the European Renaissance, scientific inquiry was advancing so rapidly that the well-established ontological conceptions of the universe, which had been accepted since ancient times, were beginning to unravel. Groundbreaking discoveries like Galileo's proof that the Earth revolved around the Sun were upsetting the established order of things. Powerful institutions like monarchies and the Church did their best to restrain such progress. Reordering ontological understanding was painful and met much resistance, but ultimately, those new ideas could not be contained. One of the first Europeans to begin incorporating this new era of enlightenment into an organized ontological system was René Descartes. During the 17th century, he formulated his famous first principle. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. Whoa. You see, Descartes realized that the senses sometimes failed him deceived him, and in that sense, reality as we perceive it seemed unreliable to Descartes. But Descartes realized that he could reason, he could think and question and doubt, and even by doubting his own existence, he knew for certain that he himself did exist because some entity had to be doing that doubting. In that sense, Descartes was an idealist. He came to believe that the only reliable experience of reality occurs within our human consciousness, within the mind. Descartes believed that knowledge must be logically teased out from the general to the specific through the process of deductive reasoning. First, we must establish irrefutable and broad first principles like, I think therefore I am, and from there we can deduce more specific conclusions about reality. About a century later in the 1700s, David Hume, a Scottish philosopher, 
took the opposite position, materialism. Hume held that the only meaningful and reliable reality is the one we can observe and measure with our senses. Hume broke new ground on the philosophy of empiricism or empirical materialism. The belief that only our senses can provide us real, meaningful information about the world. As Hume puts it, causes and effects are discoverable not by reason, but by experience. According to empiricism, the human mind is incapable of reasoning out the truth about our world. The only way to discover truth is to perceive, to witness, to measure and observe material reality. In this sense, Hume's version of hard empiricism is inductive. We begin by making specific measurements and observations. We take data and then we look for patterns. And then we work towards more general conclusions. So Hume was hella skeptical. He questioned the very notion of cause and effect, and he felt it would never be possible for humanity to have a complete understanding of our world. According to Hume, humans can't prove that reality will keep working in the way we've been seeing it working up until now. There's no way to be certain that any minute now, gravity, for instance, might simply stop working. The rules of the game might change suddenly at any moment, according to Hume, and so the only things we can really be sure of are the things that we can observe in the here and now. A bit later, a German philosopher named Immanuel Kant tried to tackle Hume's radical skepticism. He wanted to develop a scientific form of philosophy that would allow us to know what we know. Now, a fancy word for this endeavor is epistemology, the study of knowledge. Kant believed that humanity needed to know how we can know what we know before we can begin tackling those deeper questions about the nature of reality. Like Hume, Kant was skeptical of the dogmatic metaphysics of the ancient world. He didn't believe we could simply comprehend objects and people and the nature of reality using common sense. Kant determined that our understanding of reality is constrained by the very nature of our consciousness. To Kant, science can't tell us the true nature of the universe, the true nature of reality. It can only tell us how nature, how reality can appear to our human consciousness. Kant's exploration of the conscious perception of reality set off a firestorm of philosophy in Germany, which came to be called German idealism. Philosophers such as Johann Fichte, Friedrich Schilling, Arthur Schopenhauer, and many others continued to speculate, debate, and examine the nature of consciousness and reality in their works. And one German idealist with four names, Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, pulled all of these ideas together into a groundbreaking system of thought called absolute idealism. Hegel used dialectics, an ancient method of analyzing the world through a sort of dialogue between conflicting forces and ideas to develop his philosophy. The dialectic consists of three steps. First, a thesis is introduced, a new idea or force. This thesis is met by an antithesis, an anti-thesis, an opposing idea or force. And eventually, the thesis and antithesis form a synthesis. And we call the formation of this synthesis negation because the original thesis is negated into the synthesis by the interaction with the antithesis. In this model, all things are connected, all things affect each other dynamically. Everything is constantly changing. All things are constantly in the process of negating from one form to another. Once negation occurs, the synthesis becomes a new thesis, which will then be met by a new antithesis. And the negation will thus eventually itself be negated. We will have a negation of the negation. The important thing to understand is that Hegel saw this as a progressive process, striving toward an ultimate purpose. The dialectics of our universe in Hegel's mind negate in a definite direction, always advancing forward with a purpose, with an objective. And what is that objective? Well, Hegel came to believe that humanity is collectively pursuing an understanding of absolute truth, a singular universal understanding which, once we discover it, would unify all thoughts and understanding together. According to Hegel, humanity has been collectively advancing through stages of understanding throughout history. And someday, through the process of dialectical conflict and negation, humanity will arrive at this state of absolute truth. And it'll be super cool when we get there, according to Hegel.
Hegel was an idealist, but he knew that there was a material reality outside of our consciousness. He believed that the only way for us to conceive of this material reality was through our consciousness. And so he believed conscious thought was the dialectical engine that would bring us eventually to absolute understanding of the absolute truth. Hegel died in 1831, and in the ensuing decade, a group of German philosophers deemed by history as the young Hegelians emerged, developing ideas on top of Hegel's monumental philosophical system. The young Hegelians built their ideas on Hegel's system of philosophy, but they also challenged his philosophy in their own diverging directions. Max Stirner developed egoism, which puts the individual ego in a place of central importance in philosophy. Ludwig Feuerbach developed a bombastic philosophy outlining a divine purpose for humanity. Bruno Bauer, who had studied directly under Hegel, developed a free-thinking atheistic philosophy of self-consciousness. What unified these young Hegelians was that all of them built their philosophies on the foundations of Hegelian idealism. All of them, that is, except for these two fellas. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels were heavily influenced by Hegel, just like their young Hegelian peers, but they were sharply distinguished from the other young Hegelians by their fundamental break with idealism. Marx and Engels saw dialectics as a useful system for comprehending reality, but unlike Hegel, they did not believe that truth flowed only from what we could find and reason out in our consciousness. Like David Hume, they were materialists. So Marx and Engels saw the material, physical world as the first basis for our reality and believe that our conscious thoughts follow from our material conditions. So Marx and Engels took Hegel's system of idealist dialectics and combined it with materialism to develop their new system of dialectical materialism. In developing dialectical materialism, Marx sought to demystify the system which Hegel had developed, writing, my dialectic method is not only different from the Hegelian, but it is its direct opposite. According to Hegel, the human brain, through the process of thinking, transforms into an independent subject, creating our experience of the real world. And the real world is thus only an external phenomena of human consciousness. It's not that Hegel believed that the human mind created the world, but that what we experience as the world is created in the mind. Does that make sense? Basically, there's this external world all around us, but we can't experience it directly. We can only experience a version of it, which is created by and within our minds, our consciousness. According to Hegel, the human mind and the process of thought are independent of this external reality, which Marx dismissed as mysticism. As Marx says, with me, on the contrary, the ideal is nothing else than the material world reflected by the human mind and translated into forms of thought. Marx didn't see dialectics as a mystical engine of reality unfolding towards some absolute truth like Hegel did. Instead, he simply saw dialectics as a system that was suitable for describing and analyzing complicated systems in a way that could be easily processed by the human mind. Engels described the great basic thought of dialectical materialism this way. The world is not to be comprehended as a complex of ready-made things, but as a complex of processes in which the things apparently stable, the concepts, go through an uninterrupted change of coming into being and passing away. This perspective sees everything in existence as constantly undergoing change. It sees reality as a complex and dynamic system in which different forces are always acting on one another. Now, Marx had a major problem with the form of materialism that was popular in his day, which was based on Hume's empiricism. It was also known as positivism. To Marx, that kind of hard empiricism focused too much on the source of knowledge, our senses, and completely ignored the form of knowledge, our thoughts and our ideas and our thought structures. Now, Marx believed that Hume's hard empirical materialism had roughly the same flaw as idealism. That is to say, a lack of a connection between the material and the ideal. The idealist dismissed all sense data as unreliable and relied exclusively on inductive reasoning and consciousness, whereas the empiricist dismissed conscious thought to focus solely on what could be sensed. Dialectical materialism bridged this gap, taking into account the transition from the material world which we sense 
to the ideal world of our consciousness. Now let's take a brief detour to discuss the scientific methods which have gradually formed throughout the 19th and 20th centuries and continue to evolve today. Scientific methods attempt to blend deductive and inductive reasoning together to verify facts about reality as concretely as possible, which dialectical materialism also attempts to do, but we'll get to that later. Now, there are many different scientific methodologies in use today, but they all follow a general pattern. They typically begin with a hypothesis, an educated guess about what might happen in a given set of circumstances. This hypothesis is then tested through experimentation and careful observation, and then conclusions are drawn from the experiment's results. A common criticism of dialectical materialism is that it's somehow opposed to scientific methods used by scientists today, but this has never been the case. Marx and Engels did not see dialectical materialism as a replacement for or in conflict with scientific methods of inquiry. They actually trusted the data and observations that were made through scientific methods, and they used that data as evidence in their own works. Marx and Engels simply saw dialectical materialism as a way of describing and analyzing the dynamics in our world which cause all things to undergo constant change, but never in opposition to conclusions that are drawn from scientific experimentation and observation. Dialectical materialism is simply a way of looking at a large, complicated system from every angle using both deductive and inductive reasoning to consider every aspect of a process or a system rooted in data which has been observed, which has been derived from scientific methods. Both scientific methods and dialectical materialism were developed in opposition to idealism, but also against the older form of positivist and empirical materialism, which had been pioneered by David Hume, which considered only things which could be measured and observed with our senses as real and meaningful. Both scientific methods and dialectical materialism have thus been used in the soft sciences, such as psychology and sociology, to study processes and systems which can't be physically measured, such as the processes of consciousness. And dialectical materialism relies on scientifically generated data to understand the dynamic processes that shape our world. There is no conflict between scientific methods and dialectical materialism, they can live in harmony.